All right, Zig coming in on the top. Today, we have the legendary Ian Mackay. You might know him from his work with Koriki, The Evens, Fugazi, Minor Threat, Embrace, Pale Head, uh, Teen Idols, Discord Records. However you may know of Ian, the inspiration stays the same for a lot of us. Here is someone who showed us that you can do it your own way. It can all be done yourself. If you have enough dedication and focus, one can find what they want to do and do it to the max. And Ian's still doing it. This is an interview that I've had in the works for the last like year. We've been going back and forth. And Ian's the first person I reached out to to interview that wasn't from the inner Cleveland music scene. And that's because Ian shows that it's possible. It's possible for someone who has their own crazy idea to go head first into it and make it happen. So a lot of this interview is kind of diving into what inspires and inspired. Lots of insightful takes on things. It was an honor and a privilege to have this conversation and I'm very excited to share this with you guys. Before we uh, before we get into the conversation, I also I want to I want to preference it by saying um, sonically this might be different from the previous interviews. Um, this was all kind of rushed. This was the week before Christmas, and um, uh, Ian's just a busy guy. And then I I don't know if he wasn't a busy guy, I'd be disappointed. But anyway, that being said, um, so this was kind of rushed into it. We used Skype, and I don't know if it was my board setting or or if it was because of Skype or the mic he was using. But there was like a noise gate put on it, so the background noise from his uh from his um, mic, cuts in and cuts out. Gabriel Xavier did an amazing job of limiting that, so this may be nothing, but if you know some weird cuts and pauses, it's because of some of the technology, either on my end or on his end, most likely on my end. And don't let that deter you from what Ian has to say. Um, also, I want to shout Gabriel Xavier, um, filmmaker, musician from Cleveland, who introduced me to Ian's music and the DIY method and has gone through the punk rock trenches with uh, with me and Dakota Michael Kroos um, through so many things. They were supposed to join me during this interview, but they, due to uh, conflicts and time and distance, it didn't pan out. So um, I can't thank... Uh, Gabriel Xavier enough for introducing me to this to this music and this mindset and uh, every once in a while you'll meet a friend who changes your perspective on life and I'm lucky to get to see them all the time hold those people dear my friends um we're gonna listen to a Ko Ricky track this is BQM off Ko Ricky's self-titled record BQM off Cole Ricky's self-titled record that came out earlier in 2020. It's an amazing record. I highly recommend to listen. Um, other Discord news. Discord is putting out a box set of the first six EPs. Um, and they do an amazing job of remaking these EPs to be exactly like the ones when they came out earlier in the 80s. And like they're different sizes. They have all the notes. It's re a really detailed package. You can tell it was a, a product of love. So check out Discord.com for that. If you're new to the show, I play in a band called C Level, letter C dash level. Um, we're a funk punk reggae rock band. And uh, just as a quick update for what we have going on, uh, April 29th, we are playing at the Beachland Ballroom with uh, the Quasi Kings and um, Camel Butter and Unk D. So if you're in the Cleveland area and you want to check out some local music, please support us on that bill. Um, this was an honor and a privilege to talk to Ian Mackay and... If you guys can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast and all the podcast platforms, it helps me keep talking to cool guests and sharing those insights with you. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Ian. Gotcha. I'm about meaning or feeling. Was I it, think doing. Doing? Well, that's, yeah. that's interesting because uh, that kind of will lead into a good first question. Like, um, your writing style, as far as like what I've picked up from other interviews, is pretty much based on that, right? Like when you take a like uh, from what I've heard from bits of like you taking diary notes or uh, notes on what happens, they all seem to be pretty pretty factual. That's interesting. Yeah, it's true that when my journals or diaries, um, pretty early on, I decided that if I was going to keep any kind of record of what I was doing, that I would just write mostly what I did. But there was a logic. And the logic was that if I wrote what I did, I might remember how I felt. But if I wrote what I felt, I would never remember what I did um, over decades of time, you know, which is true. Like I actually this morning was looking at a journal entry that I wrote in 1981 
just talking about what I did. And it gave me some, I think it gave me a sense of how, how I felt at the time. Um, I think if I had just written that I was, you know, depressed about this, or if I'd been, I was, you know, what a great guy. This band was so, these guys are so nice, whatever. I wouldn't have had any context of where I was. And I, I don't know. I, so I feel like that was my thinking at the time. In any event, that's what I did. So I doesn't, it's just the way it is. Um, I'm, I'm not a, um, when I say, like, it's not that I don't deny feelings or meaning. I, those things are important to me. What I find problematic is the, um, the attempt to s- s- <clears throat> summarize my feelings in the English language. Um, it's, it's a limited vernacular or language, period. Um, feelings are much more involved, and I can't put them into words. I often said to people, you know, music is like, I know what songs are about, but I literally can't put them into words. Um, that's just the truth. I don't you know, for me, that's just the, the reality. Um, but I don't mean, I'm not cold and impersonal. I just rather, I'm, I just think that the, the things I have any real power over is the work that's in front of me. And the people say to me, ask me a question, go, well, how does it feel to have been in a band that has affected so many people? I, I, I don't know. Like, I feel like me. <laughs> I don't know. That's what I feel like. It's, I mean, people have often said, like, you know, you know, what's it like growing up in Washington, D.C.? I don't know. I never grew up anywhere else. <clears throat> I don't know how to answer that question, really. It's yeah. a, I can, but if someone says to me, tell me about like what you did when you were 10 years old, like what kind of life you were living. I can answer that. That's a factual question, right? Um, I'm not really sure if I follow your connection to the songwriting process. Um, what did you hear that made you think of that? Oh, no, I just meant writing in general. Cause I, oh, you, writing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you come from a, a family of writers, right? Yeah, and yeah, like, sure. Because uh, your dad, did your dad write for a paper? Yeah, my father was, well, he was in the Washington Post for 20 years. But before that, he worked for the Houston Chronicle and the Minneapolis Star. Um, he also was on a wire, so he was on the White House Press Corps under Kennedy and Johnson. Wow. He started, after he retired from the Post in 86, he started um, a magazine called In Trust, which is a, a journal about uh, seminary and governance. Seminaries are where, you know, priests, people go to get, become priests, like universities for priests. And governance is just the way those things, the way they're operated. So he has a journal. It's like a, it's like an industry journal for seminaries. Um, and he's still writing. My dad's 87. He's working on, he's writing stuff now. He's working on memoir stuff. Um, my mother was also a brilliant writer. She didn't have many jobs working. She grew up at a time as a homemaker, um, where she lived most of her life as a homemaker. She had, we have she had five kids, um, but she never stopped writing. And when she died, she died seventeen years ago. When she died, she left sixty years of journals edited, typed up and edited journals, um, and it's an incredible amount of writing and and mountains of correspondence. She kept copies, carbon copies of her, of her correspondence. She was an absolutely brilliant writer. And, um, I've barely scraped the surface of her, um, journals. I've read a lot, but man, there's so much. And I actually, <clears throat> one thing I did to give you an idea of the way I spend my time, uh, after she died, you know, she left all of, she had like three filing cabinets full of papers and there's, one one set, right? There, there's no duplicates. So I bought a scanner that would do 20 pages a minute. Wow. And I spent a year, I'm not even done still, but I've scanned hundreds of thousands of pages um, just because it felt like if there's a fire or a flood, then all that work is gone, you know. Um, now it's sort of in a position where, you know, it can be shared among the family, but she's an absolutely brilliant writer. My grandparents on all both sides are writers, um, magazine writers, book writers, English teachers. 
um, newspaper writers. My older siblings, my sisters are both have, they do words, you know, my brother is a brilliant writer. My sister Amanda is a great writer. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of writers. <laughs> uh, I actually, ironically, I really struggle with writing. I don't, you know, writing music or writing lyrics, I can do. Writing essays or people always want me to write a book. I that is so hard for me. That's not the way I think. You know, I can't figure out. For instance. If I was to write about my life, and so much of my life is, um, you know, I'm really connected to people. So, so much of my life uh, and my experiences are with those people. So, for me to write about those things, it would have to, I would have to attach strings to their arms and legs and make them dance, right? You know, that's part of you know, One second, my phone. So, um, I can't figure out how to attach strings to their arms and legs. I can't figure out how to make them characters in my story. Um, and I it just, yeah, it's really exhausting. I think I also, I feel like when I write, I often kind of get in the weeds. Guys, start getting to the details. I'm good at talking and I can answer questions. I can tell stories. I'm a rock and tour. Um, but I'm when it comes to writing, it's much more difficult for me. Understandable. It's hard. It's hard to convey like emotion with text, and uh, the kind of speak upon. That's really cool that your mother left all that. Like my mom just passed, and like if she had an account like that, that would be fascinating to be able to dive in and see what yep. those experiences were. So I imagine that's like a really kind of like heartbreaking and inspiring process to kind of go through and like not heartbreaking for me at all. I have to say not heartbreaking at all. No, not for me. I'm actually joyful about like, I'm people say, God, it must be really sad. It's not sad at all. It's a gift. Um, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, I have, you know, hours and hours and hours of tapes of her, she, you know, before she died, she actually recorded 13 hours of oral history, just talking about her childhood. Yeah. And some people say, "Guy, how can you listen to it? Are you kidding? I hear my mom's voice? Yeah. Like, I'm, it makes me happy. I love it. Um, death is natural. Right. You know, it's just now, it's, it's the second most natural thing in life. Right? Behind birth. Right? Everybody does it. It's absolutely natural. And there are circumstances that may seem unnatural. I get it. But um, ultimately, it's what we all do. So um, I think that the the fact that people leave evidence, whether it's handwriting or um, music, um, art, uh, even decorations, anything, the evidence they leave is a gift. Definitely. Yeah, that's how I look at it. So I'm not, you know, I mean, occasionally I might read something in her journals that, you know, where, you know, I feel like maybe there's a misunderstanding. I didn't really have many misunderstandings with my mom, but I don't. So, but maybe she, there was something in her journal and I was like, Oh, mom, sorry. I made her worry or whatever, you know, but I'm not really, it's not, I'm not, I have no regrets. I don't really, I don't really traffic in regret. Yeah. That's beautiful, though. That's beautiful that that have that. It's like I'd imagine it's a fine line between the two, but it's cool that in this case, in your case, that it, it's celebratory. Um, the kind of like one one thing I found interesting um, was a uh, I don't know how to put this question. How did a uh, how did, on an audio account? How did uh, your grandmother affect the musical dynamics of Fugazi? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, I think you're referring to something you must have heard me talk about at some point. Cause yeah, it's it's a, a really obscure question. Uh, cause you haven't really talked about my grandmother. Um, my grandmother, Dorothy, who's my father's mother, she, uh, was interested in what we were up to. In 1980, I was playing bass in the teen idols, I D L E S idols. Um, and we were playing in a place called Fred's Inn in Northeast Washington here. And she came along with my father, my mother, a friend of theirs, my sister Amanda, who would have been 10, I guess, 9 or 10 at the time. 
and they came to see us play. It was, just, it was like a restaurant bar kind of place. Um, not a usual venue. It wasn't like a rock concert hall. It was just like a place, a neighborhood bar, basically, that let everybody in. And they came to the um, show, and my mother brought a tape recorder. She, rec- she had a Panasonic tape deck, little carrier thing, and she recorded the show. And um, she uh, kept the tape running as they left the venue, which is amazing. You hear it's playing, and then you hear them leaving, walking, you know, going to the bathroom. Like, my sister and my mom go and use the bathroom, wash their hands, and they're talking about the show. And then they walk out back to the club. We're really loud. We're playing still. They go out the front door. It's an empty 12th Street Northeast. You hear them walking on the street. You can hear the teen idols echoing down the street. It's really great. And they're just talking about, you know, they're just chatting. My mom had grown up in that neighborhood, so she was talking about, like, well, that's where the that's where the soda fountain used to be, or that's where the hobby shop, whatever. She's talking about the neighborhood. But then when they get in the car, my grandmother said, well, that was really interesting. Um, she said that she was, they were really, really energetic. There's a lot of volume, a lot of energy, a lot of sound. And then she said, um, I, you know, I've often, she said, I wonder if they were to play quietly, if some of the stuff would seem louder and if they were to play slowly, if it would seem faster, if they would, you know, and I think that really stuck with me. In terms of, this was 1980, so I mean, uh, my art hadn't even formed yet, so it wasn't like immediately I picked up on it. But when I started in Fugazi, um, I think it there was some element of that, which I thought like, you know, well, if we do quiet, then the parts that are loud will seem way fucking louder. Yeah. And if you slow something down, then the fast parts will seem faster. It just, it just was sort of. Yeah, it rhymed with what she was saying. It was just something that stuck in my mind. Now, I still have the recording. If you come by, I'll play it for you if you want. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That's so cool. It's a, it's amazing, like, with your family, how, like, artistic and, like, well thought out everyone is. And, like, I don't mean that to, like, dig on my family or anything, but it's, like, it's fascinating how everyone's uh, account is kind of, like, uh, spoke loudly. Like, maybe it's a communication thing that panned out really well for you guys, which is cool. Um, and coming from like a, um, like with the bounce back to kind of the writing thing, um, one thing I've noticed with, with, it seems how you've gone through your musical career is like every project and every band is its own thing, then on to the next thing. And right. you seem to not have any regrets or, or nostalgia for what came before, but what is coming next and what is happening now, um, which is, an amazing mindset to get into, I think, because so much of like other groups and other, other artists harp on what they did before and tried to like live in this past. Um, does coming from like, does, or does like the influence of your family and just being around like people who are always kind of forward thinking like that inspire that type of mindset? Or was this like a, a through doing music, like it became easier to be, I'm here now I'm doing this. Because I think that's such like a, a Zen-like state people want to get in. And I'm trying to find the right way to ask this question. Um, so, What is the question? I guess the question, the question being like that mindset of here I am now, I'm doing this. Right? A lot of people struggle with just being able to focus on what they're doing now. Um, and you seem to have naturally, that's, that's how you handle things. Like I heard on one account... Uh, you told the story about when you were in a hospital in Australia and you're mm-hmm. like, I'm doing the hospital now. I'm doing right. this. I'm experiencing this now. And I guess my question is, did that mindset come from being around a family of writers and forward thinkers? Or did that mindset kind of come from doing music and moving from one project to the next? Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure if I would qualify my family as forward thinkers. I'm not sure what you're using as a basis for that, but I mean, I do think my family are interesting. They're interesting people. Um, and they're interested in, they're interested in how other people want to live. They don't, they're not judgmental about it. Um, my family is peculiar because we're small. Both my parents are only children. So I have no aunts or uncles or cousins. Um, and we're tight, you know, I still like, I, I saw my dad, I saw my brother, my sister Katie, my sister Amanda, and my dad for dinner on Sunday. We see each other 
almost every Sunday night. I have tea with my father tomorrow. Um, we regularly see each other. We're all in touch. My other, our other sister, Susanna, lives in Oakland, so we don't get to see her as much. Um, but for years, it was just basically the five, the five kids and the two parents, and that's that was all there was. Now we have, you know, partners and children of our own. Um, but we're a tight family, and I and I think that part of but I would say we're not, it's not a very judgmental family. We're not, you know, we just, everyone is weird and does their thing. And we all, we just, that's how it works. And our parents, I think both of our parents were really, um, I, I've always told people that my parents were supportive. I didn't understand the time that that was code for they were paying for things. That's not what I meant at all. What I meant to say by saying supportive is that, my parents, for, in my case, certainly told me to fo- basically follow my heart, do what I want to do with my life. Um, and that's how I've done it. And I think that's what they said to all the kids. Like, like there's no, no one's worried about other people's, how much money they have. We don't care what people do. It's not, there's no, like, that's not a very good job or you should get a better job. We don't think like that. Like, we just feel like people who are living their lives and, and, and they make their choices. And obviously if somebody's unhappy in the family, we are concerned about it, but we don't ever think that, you know, they should be striving. I guess we're not strivers in the way that most people, I think most people are. Um, but it's hard for me to compare because I don't have any other, I've never been in any other family. So I don't really <laughs> know. I don't know what it's like. Um, I, all I can say is that my yeah, my fam, my family is um, seems comfortable with eccentricities, and um, which is good because yeah. we're eccentric. And in terms of the way I go about things, I don't know if it's a family thing, although I suppose to some degree it is, um, or at least the training, like the way I. The way I was raised, I think, gave me the, you know, sort of the ability to arrive at that. I, you know, as a parent, you know, years ago, long before I ever had a kid, someone asked me if I could only teach it, if I had a child and you know, teach that teach that child one thing, what would the one thing be? And I thought about it for a long time. Um, and my answer is that it's okay to be wrong. That's the one lesson. Because if it's okay to be wrong. Then you can get fucking right. Right. But if it's not okay to be wrong, then you can never be wrong. So everything you do that is wrong, you think is right. And that gets you into trouble. Right? That gets you yeah. into it gets other people into trouble. So the idea, my thing was like that you can make mistakes, you can be wrong, and then you can change your course. You you're in control. I mean, ultimately, um, as a parent, I feel like what I'm really interested in doing is trying to supply my child with tools to navigate how he lives or what he does, like what he does with his life. I don't know. I don't have any, I don't have any idea what he'll do and I don't have any plans for him or hopes for him other than that it's his life that he's living. Not mine or not society's, or not somebody else's, but he lives the way he wants to live. That has been a pretty crucially important concept for me growing up. This goes way back. I remember listening to it. And you, if you've studied podcasts or listened to interviews, I'm sure you've heard me talk about this. But there was a song by Jimi Hendrix called it Six or Nine. Um, at the very end of that song, there's a little coda bit where he says, he just speaks these lines. I'm the one who has to die when it's time for me to die. So let me, let me live my life the way I want to. And it made so much sense to me as a kid that life is, it's just weird. It's like, it's, it's my life. And like why people are telling me how to live would seem crazy. You know, like I'm, it's my life. And so I, um, that really stuck with me. That song, that phrase informed straight edge. Because I was a straight kid and I was being ridiculed for it. So I wrote a song about my right to live how I wanted to live. Um, but there's something to that sense of um, connection with my own existence that I realized it's all a dream anyway. 
So live it well. Be well, do well. Right? It's all in this is if you if you applied logic to life, you would go insane. Yeah. So I apply acceptance. Hmm. And since do you know the song there's a song, song number one by Fugazi? Mm-hmm. There's a chorus, it's it's nothing. That's the chorus. I mean it. Like life it's all nothing. And so we place the value on things. And if that's the case, then do well and be well. You know, that yeah. that's how I live. But I can't say I learned that from maybe I learned that from my parents, maybe. I don't know. I just it's just the way I think about things. But it's not spiritually based. I don't have any I'm not a subscriber. I don't, I'm not a team member of anything. Yeah. I got nothing to sell, no books to recommend, nothing like that. It's just, but I don't think, I guess that's sort of the point. I don't think one needs to. Like, right. I appreciate, like, Eastern thought. I think it's interesting the way, you know, or I appreciate that, but it wouldn't make any sense to me that you have to live in the East to be spiritual. That seems weird. Right. Why, what kind of weird design would that be? You know, it's like I remember at one point arguing with a Rastafarian who was telling me that if you didn't smoke a herb, it's like they're smoking a herb was the only way to commune with God. And I said, well, I guess those Laplanders and, you know, the people up north are just out of fucking luck because they can't grow weed up in fucking Siberia or wherever yeah. the fuck they are, you know. So so I just don't – but the geographic problems with that thinking made me realize it's, not, it's all nothing. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so each person – gets to live his or her life the way they want to. That's beautiful. No, I And I agree. And I, to kind of like put it in terms of like music, which is kind of how I rationalize everything, is like no matter what what genre of music, the bit still sounds cool like and can resonate just as hard, right? Or resonate just as clearly. Let me be more clear with it. Um, then like if it's subscribed to a country song or a reggae song, all the elements of music can be found everywhere. And like, we put that in the context of kind of like spiritual or like philosophical thought, I guess any religion can have those elements within it. And to subscribe to one is to limit yourself to the others. So it's kind of like the whole Bruce Lee's like, uh, I will, I I would, I would interject though, that when you subscribe to one thing, if you really focus on one thing, you go deeper on it. So if you're a True. person who has everything at the salad bar, you're eating too much food. <laughs> you know, if you're having a plate of everything at the salad bar. But if your discernment is actually, I think, significant. And if you really, like, I love music. I study it regularly. I was telling some the other day that, like, I don't, classical stuff, I respect it, but I'm scared of it. Right. That's a big body yeah. of work. And I don't even know where I would begin. You know, like I don't, I'm just think about the kind of, there's so much of it. And who makes not just like which composer, but which arrangement, which recording, which like, which orchestra, like all these things. There's so many variations. It's crazy. And I don't, I say, I, it's just beyond me. Um, and frankly, um, it's been, I think, largely wrestled out of the hand of humans and put into the into the hands of the wealthy. Like you know, like yeah. the, you know, and I and I use the terms really specifically. Like I would say corporations, but I think it, the wealthy back then, like they were corporations. So when I say humans and corporations, but in early days of classical music, it was largely the provenance of the very very rich who were essentially corporations, so they didn't have those terms then. Um, so I, so like a lot of um, orchestras that would actually commission work, a lot of you know, those early classical pieces of work being commissioned by kings or lords or whoever. Right. And it's a very different, it's not the people's music necessarily, um, but it's still very interesting, and they're geniuses, clearly. Um, I, maybe... Maybe genius is a, a, a measure that is intimidating to me, um, just in terms of getting my mind around it. I'm still working on, like, you know, early punk. I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> you know, like, which is, 
kind of great because the more, and this is kind of to your point, to my point about your, what you're saying, is that the more I study stuff, the more I learn, the more I learn about the depth of it. You right. Know? And so going back in and sort of staying, having some sense of focus, doesn't mean I don't listen to other music. I do. I listen to other music all the time. Um, but there's nothing wrong with having a really deep relationship with a particular genre of music. Agreed. Agreed. And I think it, um, to the kind of, but to, I guess, I guess with my point, I was saying if that's all you did, like if you didn't look at any other for life, oh, it's just punk, but that would be that you'd miss out so much. Cause just like how you're saying with classical music, there's so much within it. And with country music and with jazz, there's so many of the, this intermingling thing. What's cool about music is the elements that are all in there are all the same elements, just arranged differently or thought of differently or transcribed or prescribed differently. Um, I had a, an experience once. I went down every summer here. They have this Smithsonian Folklife Festival, which is down the National Mall. And um, it's free, and you can go see all people from all over the world playing music. And I went down. There was, um, oh, man, what country was it? Um, it was an African country. I can't remember which country it was right now. Um, not Mali. May Mali. May Ghana. Anyway, it was... Okay. An African country, and there's a band playing, and they play gourds. They have like these sort of, they're like almost like xylophones with gourds under hanging underneath them to resonate. And it was just these four guys playing gourds. These these instruments are incredible sounding. It was really striking. Just a really incredible music they're making. And I suddenly, my brain just suddenly connected to the fact, like, oh, that's the bass. That's the drums. That's the guitar line. That's the other guitar line. Like that, the vocal. I, I suddenly heard. I understood the music in a way that just blew my mind. That I was able to make the that connection that you're talking about. That it's all the same elements. It's just um, using different tools, um, different voicings, different accents. Um, but it really comes; it all comes from the same place. I mean, the problem when we talk about punk or classical or country or is really that those are largely um, the, those classifications are largely servicing a market yeah. um, and have no real definition. Like I, you know, people often say, "Like, are you playing punk music?" I said, "What is punk music? Define it, and then I'll tell you." Um, it's hard. Yeah, you know, really hard, uh, and. It's those kind of terminologies are safe for general conversation. It gets a little trickier when you get into formal conversations. Um, they're often regional, like what country means. One place could mean something totally different somewhere else. I remember being told by a friend of mine who was really involved with the 80s and 90s hip hop scene that the, a lot of the rappers in New York City referred to rap from the rest of the country everywhere as country music. Huh. Like rappers from anywhere else, L.A., Houston, Atlanta, any hip hop coming out of other cities, they refer to as country. It, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. that's just funny. You know, <laughs> it'll, they're from New York, right? They're from New York, so that's their that was their their bias. That's not country music as we understand it, but it's country music as far as they're concerned. Right. It's it's same with like folk. It's all perspective of the culture and where it's coming from. That's a, yeah, folk music, you know, we were actually, there, there was a guy, he was a graduate student who was volunteering for the Folk Life Festival in 1999, and he was arguing with the organizers that um, punk bands should be invited to play. He argued that punk was folk by definition, and... Um, or by definition of folk, folk music as defined by the Smithsonian was um, an in original and indigenous form of music made by people of a community speaking about social ills and injustice. I mean, that's punk <laughs> right there. I mean, yeah. boom, typed up. And um, he argued um, that they really should, because folk at that point largely was it become kind of typecast. You know, you banjos and, you know, mandolins and, you know, kind of yeehaw stuff, you know. Yeah. 
I mean, right down to straw bales and stuff like that. And um, and that's also folk. But he was pointing out that this, in some ways, American punk in the 80s is more folk than folk was at that point. Because real. It was just yeah. really real stuff happening. And as a result of this argument, they invited Fugazi to play the 2000 Folk Life Festival as you know part of this. Because I think that they acknowledge it. And I, you know, I think... It is true. I mean, I know people who worked on it, and I've talked to them about it, and there's no question that the, especially their early 80s American punk scene, where nobody was thinking they're going to get a job out of it, they're making music for music's sake. It was a community-based operation. Really interesting. And they and it was something that largely, not just went off under the radar, but was really ignored because by people, the sort of gatekeepers of, of, of musical history, because it didn't kiss that ass of that history. Right. Well, it's not banjos. It's not the, the image that goes with the music, which is weird because that, that has nothing to do with the music. You know, the instrument, it's just the, what conveys it. It doesn't, it, the music is what's being played through it. You know, I don't know. It's, it's interesting, like how a kind of like image and stereotyped music becomes based on an image, I guess is how I want to say that. Um, did you ever learn last date? No. No? You mean learn it? Yeah. How to play it? Yeah. No. I don't do that. <laughs> I never do that. I've <laughs> never I've never learned a song from a record. No. Like I've sometimes like we'll be goofing around and I, and I'll pick out something. I can pick out stuff on the guitar, no problem. And I can be, oh, here's a chord change this kind of chord changes and they would it serves the melody of this song that I, I know. But I've never learned a song. I, I'm weird like that. Other people I know have learned all the songs. They go sit there and listen to records. I don't. Listen, I just don't relate to music that way. I can't hear. I can't break the. Um, I'm too. I accept the illusion too much. Like the illusion is that the song is the song. Right. And I don't think that I can decode it. Um, I leave it where it is. But then I write my own music. That's cool. Or I do my version of their music. Yeah, but it's interesting. I also don't know words. I don't know people's lyrics. Like I know, I think I've, you know. There's, I think one song I can think of. And I don't know if I can even do it anymore. That I that I knew most of the lyrics. It's a song called "Johnny Got His Gun" by a band called No Alternative, who are on a very obscure four song, seven inch sampler of late seventies, um, late seventies San Francisco. Um, punk. Um, hold on a second. And uh, I, for some reason, those lyrics, you know, kind of stuck with me. You know, Johnny was a hero of an American war, fought for his country and the girl next door. He became a hero, and father was proud. His parents were proud. Then the day he died, he hung a name on his shroud. You know, that, <laughs> yeah. I, for some reason, I can remember those. That's about it. Like all the other songs, I can sing certain parts of the song. I know the songs. I know if I feel them. I'm, I'm in them. I'm with them. But I couldn't repeat the words, and that's true, honestly, even for my own songs. I don't think words. I have to say that about two years ago, it occurred to me that my relationship with music, it's the music itself. Hmm. And I know what the song, as I said, I know what the songs are about. I can't put it into words. So I have all these pieces of music that I've written, riffs that I just deeply related, to, deeply involved with. And then when I want to, but if I want to share them with people, then I need to formalize them with words, you know, because otherwise it just becomes a kind of instrumental thing, which I think um, can be effective sometimes. But right. generally speaking, uh, it, moves, it loses an emotional component that I would like to have in music. And um, so when I write words, um, I see that as a necessary step to share the music with people. So it's a way of, of um, it's like frosting the piece of music. Like mm. I know what the song is about, but I can't tell you what it's about because if I did, I wouldn't have to play it. So I add the, the words, I, I write the words so that I can, it's like, a, it's like the, um, it's, it's a device 
that makes it transmittable. It's like a delivery system. Yeah. Like the idea of I'm trying to get the music into you. I use the words as a way to bridge this gap. And um, the words that I write, they they're not they're not necessarily and almost never they actually with the song the music is about, but they have to share sort of a significance. They have to have for me, they have to have the same kind of some emotional component that would convey the way I feel about this music. Right. It's complicated. Yeah. It's, it's weird. It's yeah. interesting because it's almost like the opposite of how you write because it's almost like the music is kind of an emotion that's like doesn't have like a like when you when you try to describe the emotion, it's hard to do. But it seems like the music is kind of like this emotional thing that's there and now it's put in word it's it's it seems like a weird kind of a yin yang a balance of the two i don't know i don't think with music it's mostly repetition for me okay it's just playing song the finding some notes and being struck by them and then suddenly another one appears and i start following the thread and I loop around and do it again, and then all of a sudden it just starts. I just keep going, and like that's uh, and then I just get really. I play it over, and I'm I'll play it forever. Um, and then at some point I'm like, well, I guess I want to play this for somebody. So then I have to arrange it. I have yeah. to make it into something, and then I add the words as sort of the the delivery, the thing that makes the connection. Um, I, I almost always write the music first. Uh, all, almost always, very occasionally I might have an idea for a lyric. But I kind of put that in my back pocket. It's not until I have the music that I can really arrive at a song. But I mean, that's just me. Everyone's yeah. got a different way to do it. I mean, I know people who walk around with books of lyrics and then, you know, someone will play a piece of music and like, got just a, song, just a set of words for that. And it blows my mind. It really blows my mind that people are able to just, that's just yeah. their approach. It's just a different way of doing things. But it's all, it's all the same, ultimately. Can I um can I ask you about Palehead? How'd that come about? Oh, I was Palehead is I was um nineteen this is eighty six. Uh I had been playing in a band called Embrace that had broken up and it was a pretty discouraging experience. Um, that band. We only played 11 shows, but it was really fraught. We just didn't get along very well. And if I really worked hard, it was the first sort of band, the first band I'd been in since My Own Threat. And that was, you know, there'd been a couple, couple of years. You know, 83 was the last My Own Threat show. 85 was the first Embrace show. We did 11 songs. I'm sorry, 11 shows. It was just not a, not a good experience. We had broken up. And then I, I think that all... I think it was that fall. I was in England visiting with Southern Studios. They were our partners. That they helped press stuff for us at Discord. And we worked with them. We started working with them a couple of years earlier. And I would go spend three weeks or a month in London working out there, just, you know, working with the guy who ran the place, John Loader, but also just, you know, talking to people and whatever, doing whatever I did out there. And there was this, so Southern Studios was this sort of, it was a record label, but also a production house. They also had a studio. And the studio was in a garage out back of the house. And there was a kitchen in the basement where we would go to make a little bit of lunch or make some tea. And I had gone down with the, one of the people who works there and having a cup of tea. And <clears throat> this guy came in. She said, oh, this is Al Jurgensen from Ministry. And I had heard of ministry at the time because I work in record stores and just saw them as a college dance band. Not really my thing at all. But I was like, okay, hi, I'm in. And he said, oh, I'm really getting into punk, which I thought was weird <laughs> um, because he, I'd only knew his the early ministry stuff, which was very kind of light dance stuff, I think. I mean, I'm actually, I'm speaking from distant memory that I didn't, I never studied them really, but, um, but he's a very nice guy, Al. And he was talking about punk and I was a little bit surprised just because it's also that era punk was so, such a mess. It was so many sort of 
poor thinking people involved with the punk scene at the time. And, um, but he said, Oh, I have this song, you know, do you want to sing on it? And I said, no, I, mean, I thought, no, I don't want to do that. But I went in the studio and he played this song for me and it was a pretty damn good song. And I don't ever do cameos. It's very rare. I don't do that. But I was between, I really like the situation of the embrace bam breaking up and just what a bummer that was. I had nothing else going on. And I thought, you know, it's a good song. I can write some words for that. So I just wrote some words and I went back down that night and um, I sang the song and he was stunned because my, like my cadence and like my, the way I organize the lyrics, my, the rhyming, um, just the arra- my arrangement, for me, it was second nature. I'd been in my thread. I knew how to write this stuff. But from his point of view, he was coming from a totally different tradition. And he was, he was pretty startled by how quickly it came together and how realized it was. And um, But at the time, I, he was working on, he had a, a, a band called Revolting Cox, Revco. And my understanding was those records were he would create a bunch of pieces of music and had different people sing on them. So I just assumed that this song with my vocal on it would be on a revolting Cox record. That's what I thought. Um, and it turned out he really loved the song and really wanted to do another song with me. And he wanted to make it a separate project. And um, so he was on Wax Tracks Records in Chicago and they flew me out to Chicago to come record a second song. So this, that song was this song called No Bunny. Um, the first song was Don't Stand in Line, I think. No, I Will Refuse. I Will Refuse, that's what it was. I Will Refuse. And uh, so I went out to Chicago and we recorded another song. That was the B-side. And I and then I came up with the name Palehead. Um and uh, I sort of thought that would be that. But I ended up doing four more songs. But I told him from the very beginning, like, my, a, you know, my name will never be on the record cover. And we don't, no names. Um, not signing a contract. Um, and I'm not playing any shows. Period. Um, not going to do any interviews. Not, like, this is just exists as Palehead and let it be a mystery for people. Um and that's yeah. And then that was that. But I, you know, I was a sweet guy. He was a nice guy. You know, things he got pretty fucked up later on, I think. But I think he's got it together now. Wow, that's such a good I, record. Yeah, I like that record. Yeah, I like this. The I like the song um, "Man Should Surrender." Yeah. Um, I think about that song because you know, the the refrain is "The water will still come," and uh, when that tsunami was taking parts of Japan out, or all the flooding in New Orleans, I always think like, you know, all the stuff that men do to each other or humans do to each other, all this ridiculous, the folly of it all, but ultimately water is going to take us all. It's going to win. So it underscores how pointless so much of this ugliness is. There's no point in war. War is a despicable waste of time. And, um, and all the, kind of expansionism and the building, all this stuff that people do. It's like so much, it's like the water will still come. Man should surrender. Yeah. <laughs> and by surrender, I think when people think of surrender, they think it was weakness. I don't think it's weakness at all. I think it's acceptance. I say, all right, like let's take care of each other. Yeah. Man should surrender. We don't need to win anymore. Well, that's the biggest part to acceptance is surrender. Like, Right, but I think that people, think that our culture... Quite often, people think of surrender as a form of weakness. Right. Because you're giving up to the winner. Yeah. I surrender to the winner, right? Like, I surrender, you win. Um, but actually, uh, my thinking in this is that surrendering is acceptance. Um, on a kind of a, a spin off of a question with a Kariki, um, with that project, uh, not project, band, um, I talked to Joe about some of the stuff and he went over like how intensely you guys rehearsed this and prepared that album. And, uh, Oh shoot. What was my, Oh, that's what my question was. 
So I was listening to an interview you did with a uh, uh, um, Nardwar, and yeah. he. he you, I think it's the first time anyone's ever stumped that guy because he was like, you said something about knowing what um, clean kills from, and he just kind of yeah. avoided it. And no, I think about the spot, yeah, about the spot, yeah. And I'm like, I wanted to know that answer for so long. What's that from? Oh, you haven't figured it out? No. <laughs> I think I was asking about. He says, uh, well, it says no to, uh, soap and water. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not not enough soap and water. Um, to get rid of this spot. It's a reference to Macbeth. It's, it's, um, Mac, and Macbeth, um, you know, she's, she's guilty. She has bloodstains on her hands. She can't clean her hands. That song, Clean Kill, that you're referring to is a, it's written about a, a drone operator and somebody sitting in an office block somewhere and she's operating a drone and killing people in another part of the world. So he said, there's never enough soap and water to get that spot out of your hand like you can't get you can't clean your hands of this goes back to the water <laughs> always go back to the water beautiful um another question i had because i know we're running out of time and i want to respect your guest who's there um how'd you hear about negative space that's where i met you um but that's such a little oasis in cleveland that i i have to introduce to so many people that so how did how did you hear about it when i have you, a really dear i have a very dear friend up there named danny wilkins uh-huh. um I met Danny first. He was a he was living in he's going to Kent Kent State and um he hitchhiked down to Washington DC for a protest and ended up staying at Discord House in nineteen eighty four, maybe maybe eighty three, eighty four, somewhere around there, eighty five in that area. Um and he we just became friends. So he's still he's still living up that way. He lives in Shaker Heights now and um so I think I probably spoke to him. I think the Danny and then also Dave um, at um, Beer Waves? No, my, what's, no, 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 no. Hold on. Oh, record store. I'm, lo- I'm losing the name of the record store. My Mind's Eye. Oh, Charles. Charles, Charles. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Charles. Yeah, I'm thinking I got Dave Earways in Milwaukee. Charles, I, I think the first time I, the Evens played up there, we played, first time we played another gallery, which I can't think of the name of it. Um, which one? The one, the, the one negative space. But that was like in that weird modern building, right? That uh, that might be Seventy Eighth Street. Did you play there? No. Okay. Well, it's kind what of was like, negative space. Was that like in a separate little building? It was in like an Asian mall. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking. Okay. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the, before that, we played another place. That I, the name is escaping me at the moment. It was also really cool. Basically, for the event and. Frankly, with Kariki, should we ever get to play again? Um, like, I'm committed to finding places that don't do gigs usually, or That's... they do, they're community based. Um, and so we're always looking for galleries and free spaces. I just don't want to play rock clubs. Yeah. And so, negative, I think, I'm not sure if Char- Charles may have given me a suggestion on it. It might have been him. Um, but Danny is also involved, Danny Wilkins. But mostly, I just call people up. I remember the first time, like sometimes I'll call, go to a town, I'll just call the record store and say, is there anybody there who knows anything about putting on shows? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, you know, this is Ian McKay. I'm doing this thing. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah. They're like, do you want to, you know, but I, I just like doing shows that way. It's much more, I don't have a manager. I'm not going to get a manager. I don't have an agent. I'm not going to get an agent, you know. To do it my way, and it's way more enjoyable. Uh, and I also don't work six or eight months out. Most bands have to. Yeah, I work. I usually work a few weeks out. Hmm. But the good news is, is that like the weird alternative gallery or the thrift store or the museum didn't have anybody else booked that night, right? But if you go to the rock club, they're fucking booked until twenty twenty four, right? Yeah. That's the way. The agents of agencies, I actually, I mean, in my mind, like the underground music scene, or the music scene, whatever it's called now, um, and even that which is called punk, I find it shocking how the the many ways what I would consider to be the worst aspects of the music business, namely managers and press agents and booking agents, like that structure 
that whole weird structure is a thing that had been so embraced. Whereas from in my mind, early on with the punk thing, it was completely centered on the idea that you do it yourself. So that you're making the shows, you're making the calls, you're doing the thing, and you own your own operation. But if you leave it to you, if you leave everything to a structure that's already in place, then it, it's inevitable for their convenience and their profit that they're gonna things are gonna be slotted into a certain way. And it loses as a result, you would what you lose is a um a really crucial part of culture, which is the new idea. Rock clubs are bars, by and large. They make their money through the sale of alcohol. This is not a moral like, condemnation. It's totally fine. I don't have any problem with that. As a result, though, that the band who plays their audience is that bar's clientele. That is the fact. And if the band doesn't have an audience, there is no clientele and there's no reason for the bar. The bar requires a clientele to stay open. New ideas don't have audiences because they haven't been thought of yet. So they have no place on the stage of established venues. And I'm not saying that they don't have the right to be there. I'm saying they just don't literally don't get on there because they don't draw anybody. But punk was a celebration of the new idea. People gathered and people they gathered in people's basements or in their barns or wherever the fuck to see the new idea. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? And um, so that's the area that I'm interested in. That's the area of music that I find compelling. And my work, like if I'm going to play music, I want to play in and su- play in places to support them, but also play those kinds of shows to remind people, and they do need reminding, that it's there are other places that music can be played. You don't have to go to the place, this one place to play music. Music should be everywhere. It is actually the form of communication that predates language. Definitely. Definitely. And like that it's so interesting because that's where all the like cool things happen that's where you really meet that that new person that's doing that thing that you would have never met like had you not been in an asian market <laughs> like right. or right. uh and I, that the, the purity of it like just like you said everything's plugging like because i think tonight i have to i have a gig tonight at a bar and it's mm-hmm. an acoustic thing i'm i'm just making this, yeah and like yeah. but it doesn't it doesn't creatively it's not not the same experience it's still an experience to draw from to take back from like there's nothing that's the thing i think people i think people hear my proactiveness as a as a judgment on other people it's not meant to be i my some of my dearest friends own bars and they own clubs and i've lived my god i played every club in america when i was in fugazi and they're great people doing great things many of them um, I'm a little bit troubled by the um, endless absorption of, of venues into certain, like the Live Nation, the AEG, like the, the yeah. corporate structure. That's a bummer, but that's nothing new. They've always been nipping at the heels. You know, wherever there's potential profit, they're going to be coming. Um, but I've come from a punk tradition where it's like we always we always elude that stuff. We we're interested in the free space. That is what punk is for me: the free space. That's the idea. It's the place where the new idea gets to be presented without having to kowtow to profit. That's a really important distinction. And it doesn't mean that places that are barred are bad. They're not. Does it mean that people go to bars or play at bars are bad? They're not. It just means music should be everywhere. And we shouldn't be tricked into thinking that it has to be like, oh, you're doing this. You have to do this. But unfortunately, I do think that there's a lot of the... um, I think we're being, well, I think society, not we, society is being trained um, a little bit by devices at the moment to think like, all right, well, this is the, this would be the venue for this, and this would be the venue for this, this would be the venue for this. In other words, like, like certainly like sites or apps, whatever, that are like, 
you can behave one way on this one, but if you were to behave that way on this one, then you've broke, you've crossed a line, you know. And it's really interesting to think about um, that that the environments they create environments that we feel like we have to fall into these particular places. It's never the way my brain has ever worked. Um, so it is it really it's it's an interesting time for that. So if I can ever remind um, people that oh yeah you can do this here like you know. Like, I can remember walking through the streets of Napoli or Naples. No, sorry. No, it was in, um, oh, it was in Sicily. Uh, tell me where we in. Well, anyway, I remember walking on the street, and there was this kiosk there, a little square kiosk with stools. No, no stools, just a little countertop. And there was a guy who just made sodas. Catania, that's where it was, Catania. And they, it was a guy who had like a soda fountain with like syrups and soda water and these little glasses. And he, I said, I'll have a cherry soda. So he poured cherry syrup in, put some, put it under the thing, put salsa water in, boom, hand it to me. And I drank it and I handed the glass back and then he washed it out. He had a special like glass washer thing. And I thought, it just blew my mind that I was just walking down the street and suddenly there was like a little soda stand and it was such a nice experience to think that like things can be anywhere right yeah. and that that's that felt you know and it was such a it just was a simple exchange but it was one that you know now almost well 25 years ago it happened and i still can conjure it up that little exchange no that's but that's that's enlightening um one final question um Within this might be a weird kind of like rose tinted view on everything, but with the current kind of pandemic and how we had this shutdown and like this time to kind of self reflect, did that like hearken any like remembrance of like uh, Revolution Summer in a way? No. 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 Okay. Why would it do that? I don't know. I feel like that was a watching that doc. It seemed like everyone took time to like re like reinvent themselves in a way. Oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting way of thinking about it. Huh. Except for it was forced because of horrible things. <laughs> well, I mean, first off, through the history of the world, horrible things have been happening. This is not a new state of affairs. Yeah. It's different for us, but this is not a new state of affairs. Um, but at that same time, through the history of the world, the majority of the majority of life is rich and beautiful. It's always happening. There's beautiful things happening right now as we speak. Um, I had I don't I'm not a sentimental person and I'm not nostalgic, and I don't um, I don't yeah I don't think about I don't I don't I rarely think of right as a you say revolution summer is like a really like magical time. I think that people who make films about things, it's, it's part of an, it creates, it's a narrative device. It's one of the problems with documentaries that they're mm. fake stories, all of them. Because really, um, there's no one story, right? If you have a hundred people involved with a punk scene, that's a hundred stories right there. Right. Somebody decided they want to make a, they make a documentary, especially the modern version of documentaries, which are actually. <laughs> They storyboard them? That's crazy. Hold on. Um, but I guess I, you know, I will say that when the, the sort of lockdown stuff started, I was totally comfortable with that. I mean, I, f I feel like being in a band, I mean, I did a lot of time sitting in a van for people. Um, a lot and the kind of quality of time the one has on tour that you just take life as it comes like you just go and you have to deal with things as they occur and you're in close quarters and confined so the idea of being in a house with a couple of people was easy for me um, but I'm also you mentioned earlier like that the experience I had in Australia and it's true. I really was like, I, I'm, that's what I'm doing now. Like, I'm not, I don't have any choice in the matter. Like, I couldn't tour. If I could go play shows, I would have, but I wasn't. I was too sick. I was 
and maybe dying. And um, so that's what I was doing. I don't have any regrets about it. I don't have any negative feelings about it. I just, I was doing the hospital. I was being in the hospital trying to recover from this illness. Um, and the same way, same light, now, uh, this is what we're doing. We're doing it. And life continues to be rich. I wish, I do wish the media, and this is a pointless wish, um, because it's, it's not their nature, um, but I wish they would stop terrifying the world because it's not, things are not as horrific as they make it out. Is there, I think that they know that, I think the warnings, I understand the warnings, but I think ultimately um, there's ways of navigating this that don't require misery. Uh, yeah, it's a problem. It's real yeah. for sure. It's it's for sure real, and people I know have many people have gotten sick, and some have died. Um, that would be true whether it was COVID or not, but there's COVID, and it's exacerbated that situation. Um, but I don't, but I don't think fear or stress. I don't think those are productive ways of life, and. I think of COVID as the weather. No, I can't can't control the weather. But you can dress accordingly. Right. And that's the way I live my life for the most part. Life is weather and I dress accordingly. As it comes is how I respond. I can't do anything about it. I'm I I don't I mean I almost I I'm so tired of hearing about COVID. I just will drive me crazy. Not because it's inconvenient for me. It's just because it makes me feel like there's a dearth of, of other topics that people are losing sight of this incredibly wide array of things to think about, to feel, to talk about, to experience that are all there. And yet they just largely talk about this dilemma that our society is in or the world is in but it's like talking about the weather you know say god it's so cold like it must be the it must be the weather <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah. just what it is all right i gotta go all right ian thank you thank you so much i really appreciate you taking time especially i know how crazy everything is just for you in general um, so this, this means a lot. And like, I know we've been going back and forth for like a year. So I really yeah. appreciate it. Uh, and I appreciate your patience on this. And I apologize again about the quality. I didn't mean to use this microphone on the air, but hopefully you can work with this. You can do some. Definitely. And, um, yeah. um, if you're ever in, Cle or, or when you guys come back to Cleveland, I've been working at negative space now for like six years and we'd gladly, oh, Gotti is so excited that yeah. I was talking with you. He's like, yeah. oh man. And that was uh, a great night. That was a great night. Yeah, so, let the, I'd love to come back there for sure. Um, we'll see. You know, it, it's yeah. Amy and Joe and I are you know really we're mellow. We're, I think we're going to start gigging again. We're going to start practicing again. Beautiful. Uh, regularly and, next week. Oh, hold on a second for me, okay? Mm -hmm. um, hello. Hey, I'll be right with you. I'm just finishing up. All right, right there. One second. Um, I got to jump out. All right, Ian, thank you so much. Watch you again. Sounds good. Later. Take care. See you.